Thank you. Um, so allow us to have a case. Um, <laughs> this is a this is a 43 year old female who had uh, a laparoscopic heller myotomy uh, in 2016 for type three achalasia. After the myotomy, she only had some improvement of her symptoms specifically for dysphagia. And over the past few years, she had recurrence of symptoms with worsening dysphagia to solids and liquids and pills. She has decreased PO intake over the past six months and she has lost five pounds and her exam is unrevealing. Here is her preoperative manometry from that time, and it did show an elevated IRP of 21 and frequent premature contractions. Thoughts on her intervention for the type three achalasia to the panel. Marco, I think you're muted. Okay. Yes. Oh. Marco, I think you're still muted. Um, there we go. I can hear you now. Okay. So I will do a complete workup. I will also do a barium swallow. I will do an endoscopy. Okay. So in terms of her barium swallow, the contrast cleared from the esophagus. There is no dilation noted of the esophagus and no narrowing noted at the GE junction. And as you also asked for an endoscopy, there was a small amount of retained secretions. Myotomy effect was noted from about 38 centimeters to 40 centimeters from the incisors. And the LES appeared normal with no resistance upon scope passage into the stomach. There was no endoscopic evidence of a fundoplication. And uh, there was a dilation performed at that time with just a TTS balloon dilation and performed without improvement. What size of TTS balloon it was used? Uh, tw yes, to 20. Well, I will do a real dilatation. So okay. I will start with a 30 millimeter balloon and see if that helps. Because otherwise, uh, it's kind of difficult to propose a poem if there is no evidence that there is delay emptying or problems with the LES. OK. Would you do anything else for your workup at this time? No, to be honest, in my practice, uh, I would, uh, it, after a barium swallow endoscopy and manometry, I would uh, probably, uh, well, I do a 24 hour pH monitoring because reflux can give you dysphagia. Uh, and then I would try the pneumatic dilatation. Okay. We went ahead and kept on. Yes. So we did a, a repeat manometry. This is then now after the original, this is after the myotomy. So this is the, um, this is the post-surgical manometry. IRP was nine. Um, there was only 10% failed swallows, no hypercontractile swallows. The mean DCI was around 1900 and the mean DL was 5.3, uh, but reported as difficult to measure. Anybody have comments on this uh, pattern that's seen on this high resolution manometry? I interpret it as residual contractions above the myotomy effect concerning for maybe causing some of the symptoms. And during the endoscopy actually performed an endo flip, which I have found to be useful in a post-surgical setting, although there's no specific criteria um, of how to interpret this. But um, in uh, just looking at the EGJ parameters, we can see a normal diameter, which went up to 17, a normal distensibility, which went up to eight. So suggesting that the LES was open and the myotomy that was performed was doing its job. But there were these sustained contractions noted above the myotomy effect. Um, that were approximately seven to 12 centimeters above the coral diaphragm, so above the extent that a laparoscopic Heller myotomy would reach. And in um, this, you can see the red triangle-ish areas are these abnormal contractions. Um, the myotomy effect is below that, and then the EGJ complex and the coral diaphragm are noted below that. Now, would you manage the patient any differently? So we opted for a, a 
completion myotomy um, via POEM approach. And um, we use the endoflip to guide and target the area for the myotomy. So this is actually proximal to the myotomy effect and spastic contractions were no longer seen after the poem. And so we guided and gauged the intervention pre and post um, myotomy during the poem procedure. There was no complications during the procedure and the patients tolerating solids and liquids without any dysphagia. Some residual tiny amount of chest pain, but otherwise doing quite well. How long is your follow-up? Uh, can I ask you the so-called endoflip directed uh, myotomy? Do, do you just look at the pattern, or do you actually have some figures like the DI that you measure intraoperatively to gauge it? So, in terms of the, um, in terms of the, uh, in general, when we're doing a uh, endoflip uh, on a naive patient that hasn't been previously um, intervened upon we would uh, use the parameters, the diameter and the distensibility. And uh, so looking for that improvement uh, at that level. And so looking at numeric data. In a post-surgical situation where the LES is open, we, we're going more by pattern um, of dysfunction. And uh, if we interpreted our goal to be uh, rendering that spastic contraction that we thought to be the reason for her continued symptoms, um, due to an incomplete myotomy on the original intervention. Oh, my, so, uh, may I say just one, one quick question? Uh, after 600 intraoperative manometers, I can tell you that the residual high pressure zone is the detector of the incomplete myotomy. Okay, I know the flip, I have tried that. So I think it's very valuable, but the point is, which is the pressure, residual pressure, the key point, when you have no pressure, you have a complete myotomy. Thank you. So Subhani, uh, I think it's very interesting. Um, I think uh, the, the findings, uh, may, may I ask you, um, I think you pick up the sustained contractions uh, using the endoflip. Uh, why did, the contraction not shown on the high resolution manometry. Is that because the provocation brought up this uh, contraction or is there another reason as uh, Professor Sando mentioned, it is not that reason that this is not working, it's something else. What, what do you think? I think it does go back to your original question to me. Um, I do think that the endoflip brings up a little bit more um, of these sustained contractions when provoked by uh, the bolus distension that is not necessarily replicated in a high resolution manometry catheter with wet swallows. Interesting. Okay. So, so perhaps I think Haru, are you there? Haru, you're the champion for poem. So, what do you think? Uh, yes. Uh, so, um, so, last question is a very important, I think. So uh, endoflip has a larger diameter than a catheter. So uh, compared to high resolution manometry. So uh, um, if we detect some abnormal contraction in the high resolution manometry, um, the uh, wall of the esophagus have to catch the catheter. So uh, the endoflip, in this case, endoflip uh, demonstrate the abnormal contraction of the esophageal body well. Okay. So very, very impressive. And then a treatment, uh, in this case, a type three achalasia. So I think the uh, poem is best indicated. Thank you. Thank, thanks, uh, Haru. I think this so, case illustrates the potential of endoflip. Certainly additional work needs to be done to tighten up the criteria and make it a little bit um, more predictable in terms of how we can interpret it. Um, but it was useful in this case to gauge the target and gauge adequacy of therapy. Very interesting. Okay, okay. There, there was a question earlier on um, from the audience about, besides this sort of indication, I think borderline indication or unclear diagnosis, uh, what else would you do, uh, endof use endoflip in your routine practice, so-called routine practice? <laughs> my, um, so uh, I think it's very helpful in the use of non-obstructive dysphagia. 
Um, so uh, actually for my workup, uh, I have incorporated endoflip in patients that present with uh, dysphagia uh, regularly, but I use it as an adjunct to high resolution manometry. At this point in time, I do not believe that it can replace high resolution manometry, um, but I do think that it is uh, useful to complement just for all the reasons that we were talking about, um, because uh, it gives us information on what the esophagus is doing in this provoked situation. Uh, there are also opportunities to use it in the, during intervention, like pre and post um, myotomy, uh, as well as uh, it's been used in the surgical literature as well in pre and post um, uh, surgeries like fundoplication. Okay. Simon, uh, should we go on to the next uh, case? Or? Uh, I think time is getting on a bit. I think so. I, I think we just have to thank uh, the panelists and everyone who are giving us really excellent lectures, uh, lots of discussion points. Um, there are many questions we haven't answered. So uh, firstly, this um, whole webinar is actually recorded. Uh, it will be available on the ISD's website later. And also for the questions that we cannot answer, uh, we will be trying to answer them on a Facebook page. Um, there is actually a uh, Facebook of ISDE, www.facebook.com stroke ISD esophagus. And if you join the uh, private Facebook group later on, then uh, we'll be able to answer some of these uh, questions there. So uh, may I thank everyone again for uh, um, participating in this uh, webinar. <coughs> but this is just to whet your appetite. Uh, the ISD is planning more webinars to come. The next one is going to be called Esophageal Cancer Virtual uh, Tumor Board. Um, that is going to be held on the 20th of August. So again, keep your eyes on the ISD website. Uh, that will be advertised um, uh, more. And uh, we welcome everyone to join that uh, webinar later. Well, uh, thank you everyone again. Um, enjoy the rest of your morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. And stay safe from COVID. And uh, let's see you next time. Bye.